Shiva here. I just spent yesterday, which was September 21st, attending a conference virtually at the AAAS, which is the Association for the Advancement of... Association for the AAAS, whatever it is. It's a um, organization dedicated to improving the linkages between science and society. And it's a place that I spent a lot of time when I was in graduate school. Um, I would go there kind of network with the AAAS Science Policy Fellows. I met one of um, the president's um, science advisors at AAAS. I helped run some events there. And yesterday I got to participate in yet another AAAS event, even though I'm no longer living in Washington. And that one was focused on the courts, um, the, the judicial system and the intersection of science and the courts. And I actually learned a lot. I learned that there's a test if you are um, in a court and you have to have scientific testimony. There's a test called the Daubert test, and that was established as a result of a 1993 support Supreme Court decision. It kind of provides these like vague, vague guidelines for establishing expertise um, in the courts. And actually, I didn't know that's what the Daubert test was because I have, as a freelancer, I've actually written a scientific article for a medical professional and he told me I'm writing this so I can say that I have this peer-reviewed publication and so I passed the Daubert test which means basically that the court finds you to be an expert. I spent all of yesterday actually learning about what the Daubert test is and it came about because of this um, this court case and it actually replaced a previous standard that was called Fry. Um, it was really interesting because one of the main points that kind of emerged from this discussion was this idea that scientists don't have a way to determine what's rigorous. So why are we making the courts trying to figure out, solve this problem that's rooted in the, the nature of knowledge itself? That's always really complicated when you're at this, at this conference about the intersection of science and law and the lawyers being the, the thinkers that they are, just throw it back to the scientists. And the scientists don't really have a solution like because how do we determine like what is established in um in science the answer is we don't have like a a really good way and apparently now the thing is with the daubert test there's like a bunch of different experts and then like the one side will get their expert and then the other side will get their expert and they're both experts they are pitted against each other so they're experts they both are using science, but they're using science specifically to do one thing or the other thing. And apparently the breakdown of, of the use of the Staubert test is different between civil and criminal courts. So in civil courts, they have more resources, which I gather is they have more money. In criminal courts, they don't have as much money. But it's interesting because in criminal courts, they have a lot of different science-based forensic evidence, like fingerprints and like bullets and stuff. So um, I spent this all of yesterday um, while I was tutoring, also learning about the Daubert test and it kind of um, what interesting thing that came as a result of this talk. And we're going to be I'll be publishing some blogs about what I learned on the Fancy Comma blog because there really was a lot and I paid way too much attention. I took like 50 pages of notes because it was really interesting. But um, one interesting structural ramification of the Daubert test is that it kind of introduces a form of gatekeeping in determining what makes something scientifically rigorous. And um, so I don't know if people really think about the, and it was really interesting to me that one of the um, suggestions that the lawyers had was to train judges in science. And for high tech cases in the technology world, they already do this like patent law, they train judges on the science of like, I guess what science of like algorithms and how technology works and stuff. And I also learned that as science communicators, we can write amicus briefs. In case you don't know what an amicus brief is, it's a brief, amicus means like friend of the court. You can actually write a briefing if you know how to speak legalese, which I have to partner with the legal people to do that. I would really love to write an amicus brief someday about something scientific, help the discussion of science be um, actually rigorous and like not just completely um,
based on like emotions because I guess like one thing that happens in the courtroom is they'll show some technology and they'll say something like oh this technology is like really good at identifying um this person and then like if you don't and they'll say stuff like if you don't um convict this person they'll be walking free and they'll be free to murder everyone or whatever so um the, and apparently that kind of like emotional like appeals to the jury apparently really works so um one but apparently one thing that's really interesting is that when you have juries and they're deliberating they actually talk about the science and they do kind of like they're able to like logic it out and they actually are able to understand the science in the deliberations process so one way to make the um science a bigger part of the jury so the decisions is to have the jury talk about it um and apparently like another thing that can make um courts more um evidence-based is to have the jury be able to ask questions which they do that some places so um, science communicators have a role to play in the judicial system as a scientist i have worked in the um, legislative branch of the of the U.S. government in Congress, and obviously I know there's a huge role for science there because most of the people that work in Congress are not scientists. And obviously in the executive branch, we have the president, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. That's one place that actually makes recommendations for science research and different avenues that science should go and funding where science should get funded, directions for science funding. Um, the judicial system, I don't know as much about it, so it's really interesting. Um, to see that there actually is a place for science in the judicial system as well, both on the federal level as well as in state courts. If you want to write an amicus brief with me about something that's going on in the Supreme Court, let me know because I'm really, really interested in this now to, um, to help people in the judicial system understand science better and maybe contribute to the judicial process myself because how frustrating is it to turn on the TV and see a Supreme Court case that um, was not one, or it was just not due to uh, facts or science, but due to emotions or whatever. So as scientists, our powers apply to all three branches of the government. So that's some food for thought and expect to hear more from us on the Fancy Comma blog about this.